Hi everyone, this is Dan Anderson from Intel. I'm going to give a presentation on Hyperledger Sawtooth application development using a um, simple application called Cookie Jar. So first I'll start with a brief introduction of Sawtooth, its architecture, its application development framework. And I'm going to go after that through the example code, walk through the code and run it. So what is Sawtooth? Sawtooth was started as Intel Labs project in 2014. It's a <clears throat> enterprise grade blockchain framework. Uh, it's highly modular, it supports multiple languages. It was on, it's a permitted blockchain. Um, it was donated to the Linux Foundation in 2016. Release 1.0 was made earlier this year, earlier in 2018. What is a blockchain? A blockchain is a series of state changes. It's a log of transactions. Uh, each modifies uh, the data state, which is a shared electronic distributed ledger. And each block contains one or more transactions and headers, header information. The first block for Sawtooth uh, just contains the default settings. Why do you have a blockchain? You have a blockchain because you want to share information among mutually distrusting organizations that have a shared purpose. I call them fremenies. Uh, you have an immutable transaction history. Um, transactions cannot be, de be deleted. They could be undone only by reversing the transaction with another transaction. It has high availability, crash fault tolerant. Um, and distributed among several peer nodes. Uh, when would you not have a blockchain? You would not have a blockchain when you have a highly a database for a highly centralized organization, for example, internal um, applications, or where there's other um, <clears throat> mechanisms to enforce trust. Um, for that database. A blockchain is a distributed ledger. Of course, a ledger classically is a book with several entries in it, for example, rent, rent payments or um, transactions um, for any kind of businesses. Um, the distributed ledger distributes that ledger electronically among several nodes, and each node has identical copy of that ledger. All the transactions are kept in, in blocks and which is the same copy among the several nodes. And they're cryptographically signed or crypt, cryptographically hashed. So the order of the blocks can't be changed and blocks cannot be omitted from the chain without detection. So how do you add a block? You start with a transaction. Alice initiates a transaction to Bob here. Then you add the transaction to a block um, and you propose the block. And if you elected the leader, you could publish that block. Um, all other nodes validate that block and accept it once it's validated and they all have the same copy. And that is when the new block is um, added to the blockchain. <clears throat> next, next, I'm going to cover some basics for Sawtooth. Uh, on a high level, we have a validator node, and we have several of these nodes in the network. So for each validator, we have several components. The most important is the validator, which sits on TCP port 4004. That's an internal bus for the validator for local validator node. It has one or more transaction processors attached to it. That is, these transaction processors are accepting transactions sent by the validator. Um, clients on the left send the transactions 
via the REST API in port 8008 to the validator and it forwards it from the REST API to the validator for processing. Then you also have a consensus engine, which some um, could be Poet or REST, um, REST or any other pluggable consensus algorithm you want to decide which node has the right to publish a new block. And as you see in the lower left, there's a network of these nodes, all of them running the same transaction processors and having the same copy of the blockchain. <clears throat> uh, one of the features of Sawtooth is we support multiple languages. We have SDK, it's available in Python, Rust, JavaScript, and other languages. And you can also write your client in multiple languages, and they do not have to be the same language. In fact, in many cases, you want them to be different languages just because of the of the problem space. For example, a client is often web-based, and you may want to have JavaScript for that, but that is usually not appropriate for a transaction processor, where you want something like Python, which is easy to deploy, or or Rust or Go, or which is compilable and performs a lot faster. So usually the language choices are, are different for the transaction processor and client. But you can use any language you, you choose among the supported languages. So for Sawtooth application development, what do you have? You have the transaction lifetime from the client <clears throat> to the validator to transaction processor to finally being published on the blockchain. You have basically um, three parts of a transaction of application or transaction family. Um, one is the client, which submits transactions. Two is the data model, which is how you encode and what what field you have in that transaction and the addressing scheme for each each for the data objects. Then you have the transaction processor, which accepts transactions and processes them. For example, for a bank account, you may debit or add to a, a certain amount of money to an account. So for the lifetime of a transaction, the client submits to the validator. And the, the transaction is propagated across the entire network. And each, on each network, the validator validates that transaction. And if the node is elected leader, it publishes that new, a new block with that and probably other transactions in that block and propagates that block to all the other nodes. Transaction families. When you have an application, you define a transaction family for that application. So you start with the data model in the middle. That's your how you define the transaction and what field you want in there. And that is recorded in, in the state, the data state. Then you have a client that just is a way of submitting transactions. And you have a transaction processor, that's the core code of for that transaction family that processes each transaction, validates it, and, and does any update to the validator or data state um, required. <clears throat> Sawtooth allows multiple transaction families and it can coexist on the same blockchain. And you could earn for optimization, you got multiple copies of the transaction processor um, running for each node. And if the language allows it, you can even have multiple threads to process the transaction. That allows parallel processing of transactions. The transaction processor API has four different calls. Register that registers the transaction processor. 
that instance of it apply that does the processing of the transaction processor. Then get and set state, that's to get and set variables that are in the global state. Uh, for your purposes, you just need to write the apply function. The register and get and set state functions are inherited from the base class. So all you really need to do when creating a transaction processor is create the apply function. The client, the client could take many forms. It could be a browser app, it could be a, a program as part of some daemon. It could be a, just a C, simple CLI you type on the command line. Its primary job is to package the transaction, sign it, and send it off to the validator node. And it's submitted via the REST API, which is the interface on a, on a, it's a browser type interface. And you, you do um, posts and gets, um, that is writes and reads using the REST API. <clears throat> the REST API has a rich set of commands. Uh, th these are some of the main ones available, but the, the principle two that you would use is post and get. You would post batches and a batch as I'll explain later, is a set of transactions and you post them and that sends them off to the validator. You can also get any state variable you want. So that just reads what's there in the, in the um, global state without making any changes. It's a read only operation to find out the value um, of some, at some address. <clears throat> So to create a, tra a transaction, what you do is you, um, you well, if the application, the transaction family defines the payload format. So you package that pay payload into a transaction there on the lower left. Uh, and you also um, create a, a signature for the header and then the header you have several fields, the family name and version. You have a list of inputs and outputs, and that allows for parallel processing because the validator node knows what variables can be modified. If you don't know, you could just set those to blank and assumes that every variable has potential of being modified, but it's better to set inputs and outputs because that allows the validator to process transactions in parallel, allowing a speed up in performance. Transactions are processed in parallel when the inputs and outputs do not conflict. You also have the public key of the signer and um, let's see. you have a, <clears throat> in the batch, a batch it consists of multiple transactions. And these transactions have to be atomically processed. That means that all the transactions or none of the transactions are processed. So if there's some error in, among the transactions, you back out or never pro, um, finalize all the transactions or all the transactions in that batch are rejected. So if there's one error among the transactions, all the transactions are not processed. So that's all or nothing. So, in the, and you also have another signature in, in the batch. You also have a batch list. So you got multiple batches um, and independent of each other um, in a batch list. And in, in the batch, you got multiple transactions. Although the simple case is you just have one transaction and one batch and one batch list. The data model, as I said before, is defined for your transaction family. Um, you also define how you serialize it. So uh, common methods are CSV, CBOR, protobuf. CSV is comma separated values. So you just have a value comma, another value comma, just like you have in a spreadsheet or something. CBOR is a, another common serialization 
method. Protobuf is what we recommend that you use. That's what Sawtooth uses internally. And it's a very powerful um, serialization mechanism. It's supported by several different languages and it uses multiple language support. So you could easily change your language that you implement um, your transaction processors are in without too great of repercussions. And you can also have a separate language, different languages for your client as for your transaction processor. So the address for data in the um, global state is 70 bytes, the first six bytes, first six, no, 70 hex characters. And the first six hex characters, the first three bytes, is the prefix, the transaction family prefix. So a transaction family has a unique six hex character prefix. And that is determined by taking the hash of the family name, the family name, string of the family name, take the SHA-512 hash, and you take the first six digits, hex digits of that hash, and that is the prefix you use. The remaining 64 hex characters is, is, is defined by the application. So you, you usually address data by hashing the object name, which is defined by your application. You hash object name with SHA-512 and you take the first 64 characters of that hash. So to address some element in your global state, you have the six digit prefix and the 64 digit um, hash and that gets you one specific item. And of course this must be deterministic. That is that you, every time you hash, it comes up with the same result. Um, some people worry about address collision, and um, usually it's it's not a problem, especially if you use hashing and your names are separate because of the the 64 character or 32 byte address space is so large that its uh, collisions are very unlikely. So. Both the client and the transaction processor use the same data model. The client bundling up the transaction and the transaction processor unbundling and processing the transaction. And it's bundled by first um, serializing the transaction using one of the methods I named, CBOR, CSV, Protobuf. Then it's encoded using base64. And then on the receiving side, you decode it, the base64 encoding, and you deserialize it. <clears throat> so now I will go into an example of Sawtooth application and do a walk walkthrough for it. So this example is a cookie jar application. A cookie jar is a jar full of cookies. And the operation, there's three operations. You could bake a cookie. You could bake one or more cookies and put in your cookie jar. You could eat one or more cookies from the cookie jar. And the third operation is you could count how many cookies you have in a cookie jar. Now, this is a very simple application because I want to focus on the API. I don't want to get distracted by um, having a nice GUI or, or browser interface and, and all those other necessary, but um, cluttering stuff that um, will obscure what the API is. So this is mainly to illustrate what the API is. I want you to quickly learn how to interface and use the Sawtooth API. So the transaction processor processes bake and eat actions. You could bake cookies and eat cookies. There's no count cookies. The transaction processor does not process the count operations because to count, all you have to do is just query the state from the REST API. There's no need to go to the transaction processor. The count operation is just a simple read-only operation. The source is on GitHub and the address I, sh I show there at um, under Sawtooth Cookie Jar. I also have 
two git branches um, that shows different encoding methods. So by default, it's encoded with CSV, but there's two branches that use CBOR or Protoba encoding just to show how, how it's different. I use CSV because that's a very simple way to encode. So let's start walking through the source. We'll start with a client. So the first thing you do is you initialize um, with this init function, initialize a class. Uh, it starts by opening the key file and we extract the private key and the public key from the key pair. And we create a, the private key is used to sign transactions and the public key is used to verify the, that the signature is correct. We also take the public key and use that as addressing scheme. So this is actually the key of the cookie jar. So we take, um, to, to address the cookie jar, we take the six character transaction family prefix, that's the hash of, of cookie jar and the first six characters. Then we take the hash address the specific cookie jar, which we call just simply my cookie jar. We could have multiple cookie jars, extend this code to support multiple cookie jars by using different names. But to address this one cookie jar, we take the hash of my cookie jar, the SHA-512 hash, takes first 64 hex characters of that hash and prefix it with a six character transaction family prefix, which is just the hash of cookie jar. So we have address, which is prefix and address um, suffix. So we have everything initialized now. We have the address of the cookie jar and we have the public and private keys for signing and verification. Next, and um, we have some operations. I'm gonna just illustrate the bake operation. Eat operation is very similar because bake adds to cookies and eat subtracts cookies. So I have no need to um, show you both. <clears throat> so for bake, what we do is we simply package up the transaction, which is consists of the keyword bake and the number of cookies you want. And that calls a function called wrap and send. And all that does is send that package transaction um, to the REST API. So we start by taking, by um, coming up with creating the payload for this transaction, which is the operation, comma, the amount. We encode it um, into in base 64. Uh, we get the address of the cookie jar and put that in an input and output list. So this transaction modifies one address and we list it, we specify that in a transaction header. We also take a hash of the payload and put that in a transaction header. We put the public key that we're signing with um, in there. And at the bottom you see, bottom left you see nonce. That is a set to a random number. The reason we do that is we want each transaction to be unique. So there, every transaction, even if, if it, it looks the same like this, like if you could do a bake of five cookies, if you do another transaction with a bake of five cookies, it will be different because the nonce, the random num number will be different. So that means that each transaction is unique, has a unique signature and that prevents replay attacks. Um, you can't replay the same transaction twice because they will always be different. <clears throat> Um, continuing, <coughs> excuse me. Hey, we take the transaction, we call the, the transaction method there with the header and payload and signature. Then we take the transaction and put it in transaction list. In this case is very simple. We just have one transaction and transaction list. Then we create a, a batch header for, for the batch. And that has the public key as a list of the transaction IDs. And we create the batch, which just has the transactions in there, with the transaction list in there. 
Um, and as I said, for a batch, all these transactions have to be committed. They're atomic. They all have to be done or none at all. It's all or nothing. In this case is very simple. We have um, one transaction in this batch. Then we have a batch list, which is also very simple. We just have one batch in this batch list. And we send the batch list to the REST API. Um, we use the batches REST command, and then we send the batch list that's serialized um, to the REST API. And after we send it, we want to wait around just to make sure that the transaction has been committed successfully. That is, there's no errors and the trend and the or, or node that we're talking to is, is up and running. <clears throat> so that's what wait for status does. It waits until it gets some result. That's we're in a loop here. Um, it's a time timeout loop. So we send to the REST API, we ask, how's our batch doing? We ask for the use the batch underscore status command, send an ID of that batch. And we we wait for um, a while or for a timeout and we get back a result. So the status is not pending. Um, we, we return, That's, that is it's, if its status is not pending, um, it's either successful, committed, or some sort of error. Or, um, if Otherwise, if it's still pending, we just loop again. So we keep on looping until the status is not pending. That is, the status is either successful or some sort of error. Separately, I want, okay, so we just talked about the client. Now I'm going to talk about event handling. Then next, the, talk about the transaction processor. So the event handling is optional, um, but it's a good idea for applications to use. Um, <clears throat> what event handling does is, is handle events from the, the Sawtooth network. And you could define your own events for your, your application, for your transaction family. There's two predefined events, though, that may fill all your needs. They are block commit and state delta. Every time a new block is published, a block commit event occurs. And that just gives you information about the block, what's in it. Then there's a state delta com um, event. And that occurs every time some variable in your global state changes. So it tells you something has changed in global state. And these two events are tightly coupled because state, well, state only changes on a new block. So the sequence is, is you have a block commit followed by several state delta events. And those state delta events are related to that new block. And this is a very simple Python command. It's it's written specifically for the cookie jar application, but you could easily modify it to um, for other transaction families, or it could listen to all transactions for all transaction families. And let's see, there's, okay, in the middle of the code, there's a loop there, and that loops forever and never gets escapes. But just for completeness, at the bottom, I just show some code that unsus unsubscribes two events. And that could be used in some error situation or exit um, situation. <clears throat> Next, we're going to talk about the transaction processor. The transaction processor is called by the validator node for each um, transaction. And it's usually called multiple times. The first time it's called is when, when it wants to validate that that transaction is valid. And later it's it's called when it's published as part of the block. And so the transaction processor could and does process the same transaction multiple times. In addition, of course, all the other nodes are processing that same transaction. So this 
requirement of transaction processors to be deterministic. That is, given the same inputs, you always have the same results. And you don't reference external databases or external variables or or you don't even do things like um, add a timestamp or some counter in there because you want the transaction to behave the same every time given the same inputs. So this is the apply function as I talked about earlier. That's one of the four um, AP, parts of the A API. You have um, the initialization, register a, a new transaction processor. You have apply and you have get and set. And, and everything but apply is, is already there in the base class. So to start with the apply function, you first get the header from the transaction. And then you get the payload from the transaction. And here we do we use a split command. It's a transaction encoding or serialization is very simple. It's just comma separated values and we just split based on the comma character. We just have two things in there, an action and a, the amount, the number of cookies. We also get the public key from the um, header. And then we um, perform an action. We look at the first part of the payload, the action, and, and decide what we're doing. It could be bake or eat, otherwise it's an error. And notice I use the logger um, class there to um, have some debug output. I print out the action and I print out the amount of cookies. And I, I call the appropriate function bake or eat, um, depending on, on the action. Let's look about look, let's look at the bake function. The eat function is very similar, so I'm not going to cover that here. Um, it's in the it's in the repository. You could look at it yourself later. But basically, bake um, adds cookies and eat removes cookies. So what you do is you first get the cookie jar address. It's from the it's based on the public key. Um, then we get the state based on the cookie. Draw, draw address, the state being it's a very, state is a very simple format for this transaction processor. It's just number of cookies. You could have something more elaborate. It could be a whole series of, of serialized information. Um, but for this simple example, it's just an integer stored as a string. So if there's no state there, um, the cookie jar has never, has not been created yet and there's no cookies. So we just start with our new cookie count being the amount in the bake transaction. Otherwise, the cookie jar is already present and has cookies there already. So we get the, um, let's see, we get a, the amount of cookies that were, we baked and added to the number of cookies that are already in the cookie jar. We add the two together, we encode it, and save it as state data there. And then we get the address of the cookie jar. And um, set the state, the called set state modifies the value in the global state at that address. So that's where the, the write is performed. And to get the cookie ad jar address, we have this other method. It, it just takes the the key and hashes it, and you have a, it prepends the the transaction family pre six character prefix, and the first sixty four digits of the of the hashed key is the address with the prefix to access the cookie jar. So here's some examples of using the REST API um, with Docker. Okay, um, and, and running the client. So first we get in our Docker container with a bash shell. Um, we cookiejar.py is the name of the client application. It's a CLI application. So we pass it two things, a operation and, and an account in this case, Bake and 12, baking 12 cookies. 
So what it does is the client post creates a transaction, creates a batch, and post posts the batch list using the REST API, and we get a response. And um, let's see. And later on, we want to call the client again with the count. So we call cookie jar dot py count, and that just calls the REST API and uses the state command to just read the state, which is the number of cookies, and we find out there's 12 cookies there that we just baked. So this count operation does not go through the transaction processor. It's just reading what's already there in a global state. And we can also use a sawtooth batch command to see the status of that batch. So we could see that it's already been committed. So that's just illustrating using the sawtooth batch command. And we can also use a sawtooth command to look at a batch. So here we do use sawtooth batch show and the, the address of the batch. And we can see the public key in there, signatures, um, a list of inputs and outputs, which in this case is just one, one and it's the same. The, the nonce, which I omit to save space and the SHA-250. SHA-512 of the payload and public key. So you look at all the contents of that um, batch and you notice the payload is encoded there using base 64. You see YMFRSZSWXMG. So that's unreadable. It's because it's encoded in base 64, but we could use Python or several other methods to decode that and print it. So we decode that string and what do we get? We get bake comma 12. So that's just the transaction format decoded. It's still ser serialized, but it's, it's readable and we could easily deserialize this by splitting up based on the comma. There's also a sawtooth state command which shows us the, you could look at any state that you want to. In this case, we, look, we give it the address of my cookie jar and returns data here, a 12, which is this number 12, the number of cookies in the cookie jar. We can also list the blocks. In this case, we just have two blocks. Block zero is the Genesis block, and block one is has the bake operation of creating 12 cookies. So here's an example of cloning and running um, sawtooth. So we start by cloning, or cloning and running the cookie jar application. So we just clone the, the repository and change into there. And we start, start Docker, it um, runs and creates multiple containers. Then one of the containers is called cookie jar client. We, we use Docker and create a shell into that container and we could run the client application. This app, example, I bake five cookies and I count the cookies and I see that there's five cookies there and I have lots of debug output in there. Here's an example of modifying source. In this case, I just take, I want to change from comma separated values, CSVs to protobuf. So in this case, I modify the client, cookie jar client.py and I, um, use um, serialized to string, which is a protobuf method that takes the transaction and serializes that transaction using protobufs. Um, the, the protobuf is defined at the very top here. We just, it's a very simple um, message here. It's called, I call it cookie jar transaction with just two fields, an action, a string, and an amount, which is a 32-bit unsigned integer. So takes that, uses that to serialize. Then on the cookie jar underscore tp.py, the transaction processor, we do the reverse. We, we access the transaction, extract the payload, and, um, and parse from string is the protobuf method to extract and deserialize 
that to payload and we can look at the action and the amount um, from that payload. Okay, now I'm gonna do a live demo here, um, which involves multiple steps. I'm gonna clone the Creaky Draw application. I'm gonna start it up and we're gonna take a little, just look through the logs and look at the state. So, so bear with me here. I'm gonna have to change the screen here a little bit. Let's see. <clears throat> Okay, let's start with cloning. It's just a git. You, so you gotta restart this. Okay, we start with git clone. Let's see if I typed it right. Yes. So I already have Sawtooth installed, and this is running Ubuntu. Um, Xenio Ubuntu 16.04.5 long-term support, and Sawtooth is already installed. So, so what I just did right now is just clone the cookie jar app, sawtooth application. Let's change in that directory. Okay, so let's um, build and all that does is start the, uh, the Docker file starts, um, uses docker compose.yaml. You could see on this repository, I have multiple directories. I have a Python client and Python transaction processor. Um, we also have a C++ transaction processor and a Java transaction processor. That is not used in this demo. That just illustrates that you could write the same transaction processor in multiple languages. You just use one of those languages, but you have a choice of which language you want to use. There's other languages here, but in this example, we just have three. And you can also have your client written in multiple languages too, but in this, for this, we just have a, a Python client. So. Let's start um, Docker. Actually, okay, so we have. Um, Sawtooth running, we just created a uh, blockchain with one block, a Genesis block was created with initial settings, and that's all we have. Um, let's go to another screen. Use Dr. P.S. to show what we have. So we have a cookie jar client container and that's just used to run your client application, client command line application. We have the REST API container that takes client request. We have a cookie jar transaction processor, processor that's another um, container and the Sawtooth settings transaction processor. That's the only required transaction processor. You, you always have to have that transaction processor running and that takes um, transactions and writes them to the blockchain. Then we have the validator, that's the central part of the validator node. So this is just a simple um, Sawtooth network, it's just a one node network. Um, running right now, cookie jar transaction processor and the required settings transaction processor. Let's, let's go to the directory here. 
And this is all defined in the Docker Compose.yaml file. And you can see there's multiple containers defined there. Let's do that again. So you have a cookie jar processor container, cookie jar client container, REST API, and this shows you how in each container on the commands you run to, to start it. For a validator, it's pretty complicated there. You can see we generate the initial keys and create the genesis block, then we run the validator. So, so at this point, we could run the client. So let's um, run, let's see, as you do, This starts a bash shell in the client container. And we could run, let's see here, cookie jar. PY is the name of the, of the client. So let's bake some cookies. Let's say 222 cookies, because I'm hungry. Oops, I gotta do it right. Simon says, bake. Now we can count them. And we have 222 cookies. Let's bake some more. Hundred cookies. So you can see in, for the bake, we submit the transaction with a REST API using the post command. Then later we um, check using the batch statuses REST API command to, to wait for the transaction to be committed. And then we see a, a response, it's committed. And it's in there, so there's a new block with it. So let's count the cookies. And we should have 322 cookies. That's very good. Okay. And let's go back to the other window. And you can see that there's debug output from the transaction processor saying that it received, um, actually debug output from the REST API that we received the request. Um, let's get out of the, Let's get out of there. Sawtooth. So we have a blockchain with three blocks. The block zero. Uh, okay, sorry, this is the batch list. So this is a list of batches that have been submitted. So the first one at the very bottom is um, when it was a <clears throat> transaction for the Genesis block. Then we have two bake operations there. So let's look at one of the um, batches here. Ooh, that's a big thing. I think I just typed the prefix there. Let's see what happens. Now I gotta type the whole thing. Okay, here we go. And you can see um, for this batch, we have uh, transactions. There's just one transaction with the, so we have the public key listed, the list of inputs and outputs, which is the same, a nonce value, a unique value to make that transaction unique. And at the very bottom, we have the payload there, which we could decode. Let's see if I could find out how to decode that. Yes, here it is. Let's decode that thing. 
copy of the string, including the sometimes present filler equal sign. This is base 64 encoding. I hope I have the syntax right. Yeah, so that transaction was baking 100 cookies. Finally, let's kind of list the blocks here. Let's see, sawtooth block list. So you can see there's three blocks, block zero, block one, and block two. Block zero is a genesis block with the settings, and block one and two, as I remember, they're just two bake operations. So we could list a block. Again, let's see, where's my mouse? There it is. And you can see lots of things in there. Let's see, let's do that again. This goes by too fast. So we have in that block um, uh, batches, transactions, and inputs and outputs, but the important thing is the payload, which we already decoded there. Um, you know, information about the consensus algorithm. So that's just one block. So let's go back to the presentation here. Continuing. Okay, uh, this is just a list of some references here. Uh, there's the application developer's guide at sawtooth.hyperledger.org. We also have a REST API reference um, to show you all the various ways of querying the, the blockchain node. We have um, the REST API architecture. Um, for SDK, we have SDK reference uh, at that link and that there's one SDK reference for each supported language. Then we have a discussion of transactions and batches. That's very useful um, for the cl client. Um, then we have some examples at the bottom. Sawtooth cookie jar is the example I just showed you. There's another example application, Sawtooth simple wallet, which is a little bit more complicated um, than the cookie jar, but it has an advantage of, of having examples in several languages, including JavaScript, Rust, Go, Python, um, and I think that's, I think there's a few more, but it shows examples in, of both the client and transaction processor in several languages. Then we have a simple supply application, and that was, um, written specifically for a, a course, um, the intermediate application development course. So that's a very good thing to go through. If you go to that link, if you look under um, the director, I think it's called education or, or, or docs or something, there's several PDF files. You go through those PDF files and follow the example of, follow through the example application here, and you'll learn how to develop a, a supply chain application. <clears throat> then there's a reference application called Sawtooth Supply Chain. And that's a good place to start with if you're writing a supply chain type application. Um, it's more complicated than the education example. So I would start first with the education example, then move on to the um, full-fledged Sawtooth Supply Chain um, application at the bottom. And all, this, all these applications are Apache 2 licensed and open source. Your application does not have, have to be open source. You have the option of keeping it open or, or closed as, as with the Apache 2 license. So that concludes this um, presentation on Sawtooth application development. Um, thank you.